The Peacock and the Copper Moon by Francis Amar Matthews The little frontier river Balsk flows yellow and sluggish in the short summer. In the long and bitter winter it is stopped short in its tawny curdle of tiny waves and stilled into a shimmer of icy, motionless topaz. It starts in the far-off hills, it creeps through the distant valleys, it leaps laughing at the side of small villages, it yawns widely hither, and anon it narrows to a few yards, sidling in the sullen arms of some vast and pitiful morass like this one, on the edge of which lies the hamlet of Bolsky. A handful of huts, a church with its pear-shaped gilded dome, a marketplace, a few shops of a mean quality, these are all the river passes here. Beyond the marsh, remote from the settlement, where the topaz stream glimmers between wastes of snow illimitable, where the call of the wolf is not infrequent, where the twilight comes earlier than anywhere else, filtering through a thicket of leafless boughs, where loneliness and desolation seem written over everything, there stands an isolated hut. The doors are barred, the windows tightly closed, so if there be light or life within, it may not shine forth. A rude bench is upturned at the threshold, a bucket with rusty rims lies beside it. The paths about it are trackless, in the thicket is heard a whir and clatter, the sharp note of a peacock, who comes out into the open yard to shriek and run up and down, doubtless with hunger. The sky intensely blue, riddled with stars, grows gradually brilliant on the edge of the horizon of the west, and the copper moon now disks the heavens. The peacock ceases its scream, seeing the splendour of its feathers in the new and gaudy light. Through a chink in the heavy doors glints a ray. Distantly there sounds the dull thud of horses' hoofs, pounding the new snow's softness. The gallop echoes from the marshland, that wilderness of drifted whiteness stretching for leagues to the north, and not from the direction of the village. In a moment the heavy door of the hut swung open, and an aged peasant by name Isaac stole cautiously out. With his hand to his ear he lay flat on the ground to listen the better, then arose, and nodding to his wife Katinka, who stood holding the lamp in the entrance, he muttered, She comes. A flutter of snow bounding horse high, a streak of shadow across the reddish splurge of the copper moonlight on the marsh, a shower of twigs breaking in the thicket, a willfuller shriek from the peacock darting to meet the comer, and into the hut-yard rode he who was known as the young grandson of Isaac and Katinka, Ivor Maxoff, the spendthrift, the beautiful, the undutiful, the mysterious, the travelled. He laughed as he swung from his steed, which Isaac took at once to the stable. He patted Katinka's cheek, he stroked the peacock, and entering the hut and drawing Katinka after him, he closed the door tightly. Thus the copper moon was left to make what merriment it could out of the world by itself, for within this hut it could not penetrate either at window, door, or crevice. Soon all was still, not a sound, not a breath, save the munching of Evil Maxoff's horse at his oats and corn, until toward the dawn the wooden blind of one of the windows was pushed open by a hand so fair and beautiful as to belong unmistakably to a woman. On one of its fingers shone an opal, and on the opal shone the last mocking rays of the copper moon. To meet the first chill light of the morning, the woman leaned far out, regardless of the keen air blowing on her bare white neck, from which slipped the folds of a pink velvet, fur-trimmed peignoir. Her long, fine hair hung in curling masses over her brow and about her small ears, in such profusion of splendid colour, so vivid of gold, as to savour unquestionably of art. But the face it shadowed was unmarred by any such aids. It was a face of exquisite and alluring loveliness, the face of a woman who knew her own superlative power to charm, and who possibly had been reckless in the use of it. It was a face whose capacity to love spoke alike in the slow and glamorous light of the blue eyes and the red fullness of the large and perfect mouth. As she bent, listening surely for something or someone, 
Her other hand clasped the opal-ringed one, and on it glistened diamonds by the dozens, straining those hands together in an agony of prayer and hope. Oh God, murmured she brokenly, bring to me as quickly as the lightning, him whom my soul and body and heart loveth. Bring to me here Sasha Sodobin, and may it please thee that I may be permitted to save him from the hand of his enemies who hunt him now, the hand of the spoiler, the cruel, the ravenous, the despot of my country, Russia. Anon she drew in, leaving the shutter open and crossing herself before the sacred icon on the wall. She paced the room until all the light that ever came to Bolsky in winter had arrived. When Katinka entered bringing food, she threw it upon the porcelain under the stove, enraged that anyone should think that she would eat at such a crisis. The peacock gladly pecked it up for his breakfast, while Isaac filled the stove with wood. The beautiful woman still paced up and down the room. Turning sharply, she asked of Isaac, Repeat to me what you did with the clothes. Excellency, I did burrow me a tunnel, ten feet long in the snow on the marsh twenty rods away. There I carried the clothes, the shoes, the cap, the man's whip, and buried them safe. And your tracks? Excellency, I bade Katinka let loose your excellency's horse the rope's length, and by urging and wheedling with whip and corn-bag, I lured it such a frisking pace as it kicked the snow a thousand paths all about from here to the marsh. And the studio is in perfect order, Excellency. The fresh clay? In abundance, moist to your Excellency's hand, full one hundred pounds. The fires? The lamps? All burning as for a festival. That is all. She motioned the old man away and knelt by the window, from which neither ear nor eye had wandered while she spoke. She beheld across the marsh mists, smoking in the sun, the chimneys of the village, the dome of the church. She heard the buzz and stir of newly awakened labour and desire. She thought she detected a hum of hurrying hoofs, a shout of approaching human voices, a clank of swords. The drops stood out on her brow. She crouched. She rose to laugh and clap her hands in glee. It had been but the weekly courier with his parcels, the voices of children spurred to school by fathers and mothers, and not the merciless soldiers of the imperial regiments, always on the alert on the frontiers, and never more so than when, as just now, they sought the great reward promised to him who should capture, alive or dead, the anarchist leader, Sasha Sadobin, known to be implicated here in Bolsky, with the reputed grandson of Isaac and Katinka, the spendthrift Ivor Maxhoff, the arch-enemy to the great and good Tsar. Well, the beautiful woman was glad for a moment, then again she fell prey to misery. Where tarried he? God grant that he and his pursuers come not into the hut-yard together. She left the room, and crossing the kitchen, opened the house-door and stepped out into the freezing air, while the peacock walked stately in her wake. Suddenly it gave a loud scream, prolonging its cry and spreading its handsome tail. The woman started forward, her arms extended toward the tall shadow that came before her, and in another moment Kara Kalevsky was folded in the arms of Sasha Sardobin. "'My dove of heaven,' whispered the young man. "'Thou here, and I thought thee safe in Stetlin. Wherefore is it?' "'Listen!' she murmured, even in her ecstasy of delight, being calm and mindful, as is the fashion of such natures. I came last night. I rode from Tirova, ten leagues, like the wind, knowing that thou wert due here today. The spies are on thy track, and, laughing, <laughs> on the track of the boy, Ivor Maxov. But though they will be here ere the day ends, they will not find either of those they seek, albeit they will look at them both. But, Kara, let us away. Once in their grasp, thy life and mine are ended. Nay, not so, Sasha, my beloved. The agents of the Tsar, under the leadership of Merozov himself, are not two arrows ride from us. Our safety consists in stopping precisely where we are. 
There, not a word, I beg of thee. Get thee in yonder with Isaac, and give him thy blouse, thy coat, thy vest, thy cravat, and cap. He will bury them well beside the garments of the nihilist boy, Ivor Maxoff. Again, Kara laughed. He will envelop thee in one of Katinka's best woven linen sheets, and will lead thee to me, Kara Kalevsky, the celebrated sculptress, the eccentric, the winsome, the volatile, the whimsical, in my studio. Away with you, and make haste. While Sasha Sadobin, mystified, but full of abiding confidence in this woman, preceded the aged peasant into the inner room, Katinka went about to assist her mistress. As she placed the last jewelled pin in the folds of the countess's Greek-like gown, Kara turned to her with cheeks and eyes that burned. Clasp these bracelets on my arms, Katinka, so. Fasten this fillet around my hair. I unbraid it all, and let the full sweep of the golden curls I bought in Paris for a fabulous sum fall to my knees. Well, with a laugh, it hides perfectly the short dark curls of your supposed grandson, Ivor, does it not? Oh, Excellency, muttered the peasant, surveying the exultant figure before her. Saint Michael grant that the soldiers catch you not, you and His Excellency. For you, for the cause of liberty and right, would we, Isaac and I, brisk and give our blood, because we remember. The old face glorified by its past into a smoothness as of youth, reddened with enthusiasm. We remember, she repeated, the iron ice of the mines of Siberia, the twenty years in its grasp, and the little child of our child that we left there frozen besides its frozen mother. Tis for all of that that we struggle now, to some way avenge the barbarities practised upon us and ours. Ah, oh, the wolves, the hyenas, the devils, kneeling before the sacred icon, to cheat them of their prey. The last jewel was in its place, the last film of lace folded over the bosom. Kara Kalevsky left the upper chamber and went down into her studio. It was underground. It was built as a refuge and meeting place for enemies of the governmental system of Russia. Was used as such three nights ago. Had always been kept in readiness for use as a workroom in case of necessity by Kara Kalevsky, who was, unknown to any save her secret associates, an ardent revolutionary sympathizer, the abettor and aide of her lover, Sasha Sardobin. He, it was discovered only a month ago, had headed a secret plot for the assassination of the newly crowned Tsar Nicholas. Upon his person, dead or alive, the price of 10,000 rubles had been placed, and at this moment he was being hunted like a wild beast by General Merisov, who, with a company of 100 picked men in his suite, had just now, hear the royal bells ringing, ridden into the little village of Bolsky in pursuit of his prey. At the sound of the bells, Isaac, who, his task accomplished, sat and smoked in the living room, nodded over at Katinka, who was moulding oatcakes on a smooth stone. The old woman nodded back again. They looked a stolid pair, with no soul above the pipe and the cake, no heart higher than the stove's heat in winter, the sun's ray in summer. Yet within their brains burned the frantic flame of those who believed themselves cheated of their divine right to liberty of conscience, mind, speech, and body whipped into a show of submission to a power that they only awaited the chance to overthrow. Placidly, Isaac smoked on, and Katinka, his wife, now spread the cakes to bake in the ashes. Neither of them even glanced around, as into the hut-yard, with the blast of a bugle and jingle of swords, dashed the plumed and brilliant soldiery, General Merisov, gallant, handsome, young, at their head. Katinka turned her cakes, and Isaac filled his pipe. The knock of the sabre handle of the door, the rude oath, the impatient kick, and then the general, dismounting and entering, gave the word to handcuff the two peasants, surround the hut and stable, and allow no one to quit the place alive. We are seeking a fellow called Ivor Maxov, and another named Sasha Sardobin, he said, addressing himself to Isaac. They are tracked close to your hut. The boy is said to be your grandson. Where are they now? 
Isaac shook his head. Katinka shook hers. Their nerveless immobility did not surprise the general. Accustomed to the hard-won impassivity of the Russian peasant, and thoroughly cognizant of the past history of these two. If you will not tell, we must hunt. And game is food for powder and shot. It will be wiser to answer me. Where are they? The heads of Isaac and Katinka had not finished wagging for a second time when the scream of the peacock was heard proceeding as if from the heart of the earth, followed by a burst of women's laughter, so sweet, so luscious, so entrancing, as to cause every man's cap of them all to leave his head. "'Who is that?' inquired Merisov. "'Excellency, that is Her Excellency, the Countess Kara Kalevsky, replied Katinka. Young Paul Merisov's dark eyes flashed fire. Kara Kalevsky was the one woman whom he desired to meet, of whose genius, wit, brilliancy, beauty, and fascinations he had heard so much during the past season at St. Petersburg. "'The Countess Kalevsky here?' he cried derisively. "'Preposterous! She is renowned as a woman devoted solely to the pursuit of her art. A woman free even from the suspicion of coquetry, freer still from the intrigues of revolutionists. Katinka Tolov, tell me some more probable story.' Again that sullen silence, now once more broken by the scream of the peacock and the woman's laugh. "'Where is she, the woman whose laughter I hear?' he cried, shaking his sheathed sword in the faces of the aged pair. Still silently, and with the dragging step of apparent reluctance, Isaac led the way out into the yard, where the merciful snow had covered up every trace of his path toward the marsh, and indeed of any recent footsteps. A few yards back of the hut the old peasant stopped, and nodded toward a certain depression in the level whiteness. The soldiers cleared away the snow that had fallen since Kara Kalevsky went down, disclosing a square stone with a wooden ring set in its centre. They lifted it, and waves of mellow light flooded the expanse of glistening snow. General Merisov stepped to the brink of the aperture as his men fell back respectfully. A rude ladder was placed there. He was wary, if a brave leader. He motioned Isaac to precede him in the descent, and followed with his soldiers and Katinka. Once below, in a small square anteroom, at one side of which hung heavy curtains, waving in the wind, Isaac hesitated. "'Go on,' muttered Merisov, his pistols in his hand. Then, as Katinka pushed back the curtains, he stood transfixed. The salon extended some sixty feet before him. It was at least twenty underground. The floor was of marble inlaid in quaint figures, and strewn with rich skins of bears, tigers, lions. Four huge stoves, glowing with heat, stood two at either side. Bronze lamps with globes of pink and yellow swung at intervals from the ceiling, which was of an interlaced Moorish pattern, studded with crystals. The walls were hung with shawls from India, and here and there, half shrouded, half revealed, appeared statues, gleaming ghost-like in the mysterious light of the lanterns. A few pictures of gorgeous colouring stood about on easels, and like a streak of sunshine, there spread from his feet to the farthest end of the room a narrow strip of warmest yellow silken carpet. Yonder, on a broad rail platform of wood, the whole width of the salon, towered a superb draped figure in the clay, the figure of a man in his youth his prime, his beauty. On a little ladder, close to her work, stood Kara Kalevsky, the sculptress, at one side an enormous lump of moist clay, from which she now and then took a bit as she needed, in her hands the little modelling tools of boxwood and ivory. All about her the marvellous glory of her splendid hair, the sweep of her yellow velvet robe, the sheen of jewels. At the foot of the ladder the peacock strutted, uttering again its piercing scream as it caught sight of the intruders. With a word of reproof to her pet, uttered in a voice musical as the tones of a lute, his mistress, apparently unconscious of the observers, proceeded with strong supple fingers to mould and knead the plastic clay, dipping them now and then in the porcelain basin of water, 
caressing the impassive grey clay with a touch as soft and light as true love's own. Meantime, the officer of the Tsar reasserted himself over the mere man, and the general, motioning Isaac back, lifted his hat, pocketed his pistol, and advanced, flushing, it must be recorded, at thus invading the privacy of a young and beautiful woman. At the sound of his heels grating on the marble between the firs, the countess looked up in surprise, terror, astonishment. Pardon, Excellency, murmured the general, saluting her with the most profound respect. I am Paul Merasov, general, at your service, and now here in the service of my country, seeking two wanton rebels and revolutionists, tracked to this peasant's hut. By name, Ivor Maxov, the reputed grandson of these people, and Sasha Serdobin, a young nobleman whose good birth and courtly breeding should have taught him better loyalty than to plot against his country and his emperor. My excuses, madam, I lay at your feet. Sure am I that one as loyal as every member of your family has ever been will accept them and aid me to the best of your ability. Merisov laid his sword down at the feet of Kara, who immediately motioned him to restore it to his side. General, she said with dignity, it seems to me harsh that the privacy of a woman pursuing her profession in quietness should thus be rudely broken in upon, but we will waive that. I can spare a few moments from my statue. It is of Glinka, and for the Alexandrov Theatre in Moscow, to be finished in time for the anniversary performance of life for the Tsar. Merizov drew a step nearer the model, and bowed deferentially, both in honour of Glinka and of the Countess. Very gladly, continued Kara Kalevsky, will I pause and tell you what I know. Then your Excellency does know something. If your Excellency only will tell me even your suspicions, I shall then be exonerated from the cruel duty of placing you under arrest. A mere matter of form, it is true, but a form, madam, I implore you, assist me in getting rid of. Assuredly will I. Isaac Katinka, roll an easy chair for the general. What? Perceiving the irons on the two peasants. It is not possible. Well, general, I suppose suspicion fathers many an injustice. Draw the chair yourself, I beg, so. Six months since I hired this deserted hall and hut, and these two worthy people to wait upon me. Where had I heard of this marvellous underground salon? From a very dear friend who knew of it through the chief of police in Moscow. I am impulsive, eccentric, willful if you like. The idea struck me as charming. I came bringing my clay, my tools, pictures, carpets, all the impediments we women think we cannot live without. I settled myself to work, indicating the statue, and leaning over a bit on her aerial seat to moisten her fingers and lay them on the lips and around the orifices of the ears of Glinka. Merisov gazed speechless upon the sumptuous picture before him, he was dazzled, overcome by the purity and sweetness of the woman's voice, the beauty and grace of her bearing. But besides being an impressionable man, Merisov was an alert soldier, politician, and lawyer. He said, Yes, precisely. Pardon me if I ask the name of the dear friend whose information as to this place came from the Moscow chief of police. The tone was gentle, but commanded a direct answer. The Countess hesitated an instant, while seemingly unconsciously her fingers again wandered to the basin of water, and she moistened once more the lips of the clay statue. "'The name's a woman's,' she said at last. "'Sonia Pfrioff. She's a very dear friend of mine.' The General's eyes flashed fire. "'So!' he exclaimed eagerly, then throwing back his head he continued. "'Since your Excellency has been here, have you seen the boy, Ivor Maxov? Never, replied Kara, with a little smile, emphasizing, as she spoke, the dimple in the chin of the statue with one taper finger. But I know, she went on, that he arrived last night. Merisov sprang to his feet, while Isaac and Katinka exchanged a terrified half-glance, and the soldiers stood more erectly. 
Listen, continued the countess, as she leaned against the ladder step above her, clasped her hands behind her head and spoke quietly. He stopped not ten minutes. His horse stands now in the stable. The youth himself went in that direction, pointing toward the marsh, on foot alone. He must be, having now had twelve hours' start quite far on his way to Steltin, if that were his destination. This worthy old man and woman know no more of him than you do. I beheld his arrival, though I saw not his face ever, also his swift departure. Marisov gave his orders at once for the scouring of the marsh, and amid a clatter of tongues and hoofs the men set off. Excellency, exclaimed the general, now pacing up and down the room, will you permit me to dismiss not only the rest of my men, but your servants? I desire a few moments' private conversation. Kara paused a moment, standing upon the ladder step. General, she replied, you are aware of the loyalty of my family. You see me at my work. You interrupt me at, I assure you, a critical moment. Inspiration does not come at call. I pray you leave me, else my model becomes parched, it cracks, dries, is ruined, and I with it. She laid her beautiful jewelled hand, as she spoke, upon the head of Glinka. I pray you to believe me when I say that my life, my heart, soul, mind, my past and future are bound up in this statue and its successful issue. So, sir, turning to take up her tools, I to my work, and you to yours. Countess, cries the man, I ask your pardon, but... He waves his hand to the soldiers, and Isaac and Katinka, at which signal they hastily withdraw. I must see you alone. Kara caresses the hair, the brow, of the insensate clay. Her lips move as if in inarticulate prayer. She takes the basin of water, and pours it slowly over the mass of clay, watching it trickle down the shoulders, the arms, the heavy folds of the drapery. Merizov watches her, charmed to be alone with her, and delighted to see, as he thinks, a clear path to the capture of one, at least, of those for whom he hunts. Excellency, he cries, leaning, deprecating yet commanding on his sword. Kara turns toward him, but her touch does not quit the clay. You tell me that Sonia Frioff is a very dear friend of yours. The dearest, she says, going on with her work. Excellency, drawing close to her. Then I suppose you know the story of her heart. It seems to the Countess that her statue trembles beneath her hand, but that surely must have been caused by her own agitation. You are loyal. Upon you I can rely. For the sake of your country, you would not count the cost to your friendly feelings, could you assist in putting a traitor. Well, the general takes a short turn across the salon, where he could no longer plot his devil's schemes against our most beloved sovereign. Kara leans her dimpled elbow on the clammy shoulder of the clay statue, as she says, General, I would count no cost too great to end the existence of one who was a traitor to his country. I knew it, cries the man, darting to her and speaking in low hurried tones. The path is clear, Countess Kara. Sonia Frioff, as you must know, or if she has kept it from you, I tell it to you now. Surely the statue does sway beneath the pressure of that beautiful arm. Is the loved one, the idol of Sasha Serdobin? Countess Kara looks straight at General Marisov. Her eyes burn like sapphires in sunshine. Her red lips part. The laces on her bosom throb. The yellow masses of her long hair shimmer as they lie the length of her yellow velvet gown, but she moves not. It but remains for you to return with me at once to Moscow. Visit Sonia Frioff. Learn from her the plans and whereabouts of Sasha Serdobin. Communicate these to me. The rest is simple. Kara Kalevsky remains motionless. What would the rest be? She finally murmurs. Imprisonment for life or execution. Probably the former. 
at the beginning of his reign his imperial majesty is pleased to exercise clemency. Imprisonment for life in a dungeon, echoes the woman. Do you think that would be sufficient punishment for a man who was a traitor even to a woman, setting aside a country or its government? She speaks calmly, slowly. She has removed her arm from the statue, but sits close to it, on the top step of the ladder, her head gleaming radiantly against the dull clay. Merizov looks at her and is dazzled by her exquisite beauty, so full of fire and yet so calm. No, if the woman were thee, a thousand times no. But no man can be false to thee, Karakalevsky. I have heard of thee and laughed. I have seen thee and am at thy feet. He seizes the down-hanging fringe of her sash and presses it to his lips. The woman above him rises slowly, shaking her head at him as one might an indulged child. Not now, she says gently. Today, remember you are soldier, seeking to do your duty, while I... She comes down the ladder and stands, her hands folded behind her, beside the peacock and before the modelling dais. I am a woman whose statue you would spoil. See, the heat of the stoves is drying it already. I beg you, make haste. The words are those of reproof, but their intonation is gentle as a caress. In an instant, Merezov is at her side. He attempts to take her hands in his. Then, as she retreats, Forgive me, he cries. You said your life and soul were bound up in your statue. It can be so no more if you will listen to my love. Look, I will keep it moist now, and we will set the peasants to it during your absence. Marisov fills the basin and pours it over the clay. There, so, now let me tell you all that is in my heart. Another time, returns the woman, gently withdrawing. But now to your mission. You seek my assistance in capturing Sasha Sir Dorbin. But first I must know more of him, his plans, his affairs his love for Sonia Fryov. Would you believe it, well as I knew her, the ingrate, she has never breathed a word of all this to me. Her perfect lips part in a smile so dazzling as to blind the beholder to the fact that her eyes are mirthless. Tell me, she continues, how knew you of this romance? Easily enough, Sonia Fryov is also a friend of mine. Her father and mine are brothers in arms. Sonia and I grew up together. Tis from her lips that I have learned the story of Sasha Sir Dorbin's love, from her lips that I learned of thee. Yes, yes, murmurs Kara. But first tell me more of Sonia, you see, with a laugh. <laughs> I am quite a woman in my interest in affairs of the heart. The look that rounds out her sentence goes to the head of Marisov like wine. More? What can I say more? that I have seen one of his letters to her, that they are madly passionate. Ha <laughs> ha, seen one of his letters, the woman echoes. Her laughter rings out so clear and long that she is fain to clutch her side from the pain of it. You jest with me, as though a woman would show her love letters to a man, even her foster brother. Nay, says Merozov, his hand seeking his breast pocket. I said not show. In the performance of our duty, we must sometimes intercept a letter, you know. And you have one there? You will let me see it? She bends towards Marisov, her jewelled hand outstretched, her eyes shining with a meaning that he cannot fathom. In the folds of her gown, her other hand is clutched, as in the death agony. For the space of a pulse beat, Marisov stands as still as the statue yonder, then, very slowly, he draws from its hiding place a crumpled letter and presses it into the hand of the countess. Poor Sonia, he murmurs. But what would you? Friendship is one thing and patriotism another. As you'll see by his own words, he stands convicted as a traitor. The countess answers not a word, but Marisov, watching her, notes that her fingers tremble doubtless with the agitation of a loyal subject confronted with the evidence of treachery to her country. It seems to him, too, that, as her eyes glance down the page, devouring the words, a veil settles over her face. It pales slightly, 
evidently under the blow to her patriotism, while her lips set themselves as rigidly as though of chiselled marble. As the full import of that which she reads is borne in upon her, she bursts into a laugh, harsh as the note of the peacock strutting near. Then folding the paper carefully, she returns it to him, who stands waiting, silent but with glowing eyes. Patriotism! Yes, patriotism, that is the thing, she echoes, while she summons all her strength of will to control the burning thoughts that seethe through her brain. Yes, it was worth your intercepting, and my reading. Not as a love letter, no. Indeed, it sounds to me like one copied, like one I have read somewhere before. But it convicts, oh yes, it convicts him as a traitor, as you say. A tide of colour suffuses her face now. Her head is thrown back, her nostrils are dilated, her eyes superbly scornful. Then I may rely upon you to help me, eagerly cries Marisov. Yes, ah, that is well. Until now, he has ever eluded us by the help of this will-o'-the-wisp boy, Ivor, who seems to stand between him and capture. But with thy wit we shall soon have him, and poor Sonia can get a new sweetheart, of course. Of course, returns the Countess carelessly. Then, turning to the platform, she adds, But see how quickly the heat dries up the moisture. I almost could think I saw my statue tremble. Marisov's gaze is riveted on her rather than on the clay. Suppose, she goes on in a slow, monotonous voice, as of one improvising, suppose one captured this Sasha Sardobin and brought him here, and instead of the stick of wood we sculptures use as a support in beginning a statue, we should use Sasha Sardobin and cover him with clay and pile him thick with it, and keep him moist for many hours, alive, able to breathe through the lips, the ears, the nostrils. And then if we should cease giving the water to the clay, and pile the fires higher in the stoves, and so, and so. She laughs a long high laugh, as she throws herself down at the foot of the glinker. Would not that be a very excellent punishment for a traitor, General, eh? Marizov laughs. <laughs> you remind me that I must pour more water here. He lifts the bucket, but the peacock, flapping to his wrist to drink, causes him to drop the bucket, and the water splashes over Kara Kalevsky, who shivers slightly. Then perhaps they both forget the statue. At its base, Marizov tells out all his passion and hope unrestrainedly to her. She listens impassively, yet not unwillingly. It must be but passing sweet to listen thus to love's new, strange story in the very teeth of a love that once looked quite as fair. Food was brought, and they ate it, giving the peacock his share. Wine was brought, and they drank it, leaving the cup half full. Wood was brought, and the fires replenished, so that as the day wore on, the warmth was intense, full of comfort and drowsiness. At last, Merizov, half content, half disquieted, as men must be whom women permit to uncover their souls without giving any return save the tacit one of listening, Merizov left Kara sitting there. He was to return for her at nine o'clock when they were to start for Moscow, under escort by the nearest railway. The curtains fell together, waving after him. The Countess sat still for a moment, holding her temples with her hands. Then she rose, tottering, and got up on the ladder, her face averted from the clay statue, and pushed open the snow-weighted skylight. The freezing air came in to her gratefully, as she climbed down and stood still under the open dome. Now have I lived to be old, old as Katinka. Now have I outlived hunger, thirst. The peacock still picked at the crumbs of oatcake, and she steadied the cup of wine lest he should spill it in his eagerness. Weariness, rest, good or evil, heaven or hell, hope or remorse. Kara raised her eyes to the deep sky above her. There shone the copper moon, tipped a little to one side, as if in mockery of all the world below. 
In its light her face showed drawn and lined like that of an old woman. Then of a sudden, the tide of long-ebbed feeling seemed to sweep back upon her. She rushed over to the statue. She snatched the cup of wine and moistened the parched lips. She took the other bucket and dashed the water over the head. She tore at the clay, she called. Sasha! Sasha! Would the dried, baked crust yield? Had the spirit forever fled from the being encased in the clay? With all her supreme young strength, Kara Kalevsky cast her arms around the stolid pillar and fought the imprisoning impassive mass with the weight of her body. Would the incarcerated one give an answering throw? She wailed, she shrieked. From without there came the hurrying tramp of the guards left by Merezov. She had forgotten Merezov and his men utterly. One last bitter, superhuman effort, and anon, the peacock screamed and strutted, the copper moon waxed redder in the deep sky, and the blown snow whirled over the vast dismalness of the marsh. End of section one.